the most famous dog in Scottish history was Greyfriars Bobby. This was a little Skye Terrier who belonged to a man named John Gray. According to a better researched version of the story, Gray had moved to Edinburgh from the country in 1850. And after a few years doing other things, he became a night watchman for the Edinburgh police. These night watchmen often had a watch dog with them as they patrolled. And John Gray acquired a Sky Terrier whom he named Bobby. Each day before a shift, John would stop at a local restaurant to eat, and the owner also provided dinner for the little dog. After two years of this, Gray developed a suspicious cough and was soon diagnosed with consumption, what we now call tuberculosis. He died on February 15, 1858, and was buried in Old Greyfriars Churchyard on Historic Church and Cemetery in Edinburgh. But his faithful dog, Bobby, would not be separated from him. Bobby lay down on the newly covered grave and stayed there. The curator of the cemetery, where no dogs were permitted, drove him out. A few hours later, he was back, and he continued this pattern even in the wind and rain. Eventually, the curator took pity on the wet and shivering dog and made him a small nest under a nearby bench. Each day, when the one o'clock gun fired at nearby Edinburgh Castle, Bobby would hop up and trot out of the graveyard to the nearby restaurant where the new owner continued to feed him. And this went on for years. In 1867, Edinburgh passed a stray dog law that would have required Bobby to be put down, but the mayor of the town paid for the dog's license fee himself, and the collar attesting to this can still be seen in an Edinburgh museum today. Finally, in 1872, the dog, by then known as Greyfriars Bobby, passed away at the old age of at least 16 years, 14 of which had been spent in his graveyard vigil. He had become famous, and in the 150 years since then, he's been immortalized in sculpture, books, and even a Walt Disney movie, which, of course, stretches the truth quite a bit. But why do we love this story? Because the dog and his master were inseparable, both in life and in death. We resonate with the idea of someone so faithful that nothing will prevent him from being with us. And in today's text, Romans 8, 31 to 39, one of the key things we'll learn is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because God is not a short-lived animal, nor even a mortal man, nothing, not even death, has the power to separate us from him. Romans 8 has been all about, all about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We've seen that only the Holy Spirit can free us from the habits and desires of our sinful nature as we set our minds on him. We've seen that it is the Spirit who will give life to our, to our mortal bodies. The, the Spirit, we've seen, he himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God who cry, Abba, Father. Because we have the Spirit, we groan inwardly at the fallen nature of the world, but the same Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for us with his own groans. But this week, Paul reaches the crescendo of his celebration of these things and tells us that because God is for us, nothing can be against us or condemn us or separate us from his love. So we'll break the section down into three pieces, following the lead of the questions Paul asks. Verses 31 and 32 assure us that no one can be against us. The next two verses assure us that no one can condemn us. And the last five verses, the crescendo of the crescendo, teach us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So let's read the text, Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then 
shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What then shall we say to these things? The Spirit is interceding for us. God is working all things for our good. God has foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified us. All of this shows us, without doubt, that God is for us. But notice, as Stott points out, that if Paul had simply asked, who is against us, there would be a long list. By human standards, we face formidable foes. Paul will list many of them in verse 35. Even before that, we know that the unbelieving world is opposed to us. The sinful nature is our adversary. Death is still an enemy, the last enemy. So is he who holds the power of death, that is the devil. Even the fallen, groaning creation is doomed to be against us in this present age. As Charles Dodd says in his commentary, sometimes under calamity, the whole universe seems to be against us. But Paul doesn't simply ask who is against us. He prefaces that question with an if or a since clause. Since God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer is no one, nothing. Now, Paul is not saying that the claim God is for us can be made by everybody, by every person. In fact, perhaps the most terrible words which human ears could ever hear are those which God uttered many times in the Old Testament, I am against you. He is against sin and sinners. He he is against rebels and oppressors. He is against those who hurt and destroy, but... He is for us. He has not left the world in its sin and rebellion or its people under unremitted judgment. He has loved us and sent his son for us. This is the point of the next verse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If you know the term, this is one of those arguments from the greater to the lesser. And so here the greater thing, the greatest thing, is that God did not spare his own son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus Christ was offered as a sacrifice on the cross for us. And the language that Paul uses here probably alludes to Genesis where God commends Abraham because he did not withhold or spare his son, his only son, but was willing to give him up as a sacrifice. In that case, God provided a substitute, a ram. But when it came to his own son, God did not spare him, but gave him up for us all. He was sacrificed for our sake so that through faith in him we might receive all things. And so if you look at the equation, all things is remarkably the lesser thing 
in this argument. All right, God's giving of his son is greater than everything else put together. Now, in context, all things must refer to the things we have received through the Spirit, as listed above, and specifically to our calling, justification, and glorification. But we shouldn't limit all things, even to the wonderful things of Romans 8. It, It can include other wonderful things, including all the wonders of creation that we got to enjoy and all the provisions that God, that God gives us day to day. Now, this doesn't mean that we always get everything we want in this life, but it does mean that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So if God is for us in this way, Who can be against us? Line up everyone in the world, from that family member who just slightly irritates you to to the other one who constantly gaslights you, to to that guy at work who belittles you for your commitments, to that friend on social media who always blames and curses Christianity for everything, to those world leaders who have put their own well-being ahead of their people, to others around the world who commit tragic war and violence. Line them all up. Can any one of these or all of them together undo what God has done for us? Can any of them unmake the sacrifice of the son or unpay the price that he paid? No. The only person in the universe whose opinion really counts has proven in the most graphic way possible that he is for us. Keith Hartzell, a church planter from Wheaton, Illinois, tells of a time when he was driving around with a friend whom he admired for laying down his life for others. He noticed that his friend's cell phone was locked with an unusual password, Pronobis. Keith asked why he chose that for a password. His friend said it was Latin, and it meant for us. Then suddenly his friend started choking up. Keith wondered why those two Latin words would cause so much emotion. His friend explained that after walking through deep personal pain, these were the words that brought healing. When his parents divorced, he entered a season where he assumed that God didn't care that God had given up on him. But when he decided to believe that God was pro nobis, that God had even sent Christ to die for him, for us, that was what transformed him, to be able to lay down his life for others. God is for us. No one can be against us. No one can condemn us or charge us. Verse 33, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And this question, who shall bring any charge? And the next one, asking who will accuse us and who will condemn us, bring us in our imaginations into a courtroom. And and Paul's argument here was that no prosecution can succeed against us since God, our judge, has already justified us. Once again, if the question stood on its own, many voices could be raised in accusation. Then the devil never ceases to try to press charges against us. Even his title, Diablos, means slanderer, accuser. He tries to accuse us. In Revelation, he's called the accuser of the brethren. We also have human enemies and even so-called friends, even so-called loved ones who delight to point an accusing finger at us. And most of all, we have the accusation of our own ongoing sins, as we saw in Romans 7. But no accusation will be effective because it's being made against God's elect, right? It's God's elect against whom the accusation is trying to be made. And Paul has shown in verses 28 to 30 that those who are God's elect by virtue of his calling and purpose and glory are are assured 
Therefore, all accusations fall to the ground. They glance off us like arrows off a shield. The, the, the apostle is surely echoing the words of the servant in Isaiah chapter 50, verses 8 and 9. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring any charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? And if since then this, this manner of designating Christians as elect in the question is, is itself the only answer that's needed to the question. No one can do it because it's the sovereign Lord who helps us. In verse 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Moo points out, you can, you can hear it in the verse, Paul, in his growing enthusiasm, has adopted a cryptic writing style in these verses without a lot of connecting grammar. The New International Version does a better job at turning this into a legitimate sentence. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Just as no one can accuse us of sin because we are justified, declared righteous from our sin, so no one can condemn us. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus did. First of all, he died. He died for the very sins for which we would otherwise deserve to be condemned. But instead, God condemned sin in the suffering flesh of Jesus. Romans 8, verse 3. He redeemed us from the curse or the condemnation of the law by becoming a curse for us. Galatians. Yet there's more. Paul says he not only died, he was raised to life. Death and sin did not gain a final victory over him. He was raised by God, by the Father's will and by the Spirit's power, showing God's acceptance of the Son's sacrifice as the only satisfactory basis for our justification. But there is more than that. The risen Son ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. Stott says that he is resting from his finished work, occupying the place of supreme honor, exercising his authority to save, and waiting for his final triumph. Amen. And there, at the right hand of the Father, he is also interceding for us. We saw last week that the Spirit groans within us and intercedes for us in prayer according to the Father's will when we don't know what to pray. Our other intercessor is the victorious Son, whom the book of Hebrews teaches is our high priest and heavenly advocate. His very presence at the Father's right hand is evidence of, of his completed work of atonement, and his intercession means that he continues to secure for his people the benefits of his death. So Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, where we started, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of his death, because of his resurrection, because of his ascension, because of his intercession. Those who are his are no longer under condemnation. We can therefore confidently challenge the universe with all its human inhabitants, with all its demonic inhabitants. We can ask, who is he who condemns? There will never be any created being who can again condemn us. A famous poem uh, tells a story from the 17th century when Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector of England. A court sentenced an erring soldier to be shot. The execution was to take place at the ringing of the evening curfew bell that day. But the bell did not sound. 
the soldier's fiance had climbed into the belfry and clung to the clapper of the bell to prevent it from striking. And a few minutes later, she was brought before Cromwell to account for her actions and to plead for her fiance. She wept as she showed him her bruised, bleeding hands. And Cromwell's heart was touched. He said, your beloved shall live because of your sacrifice. Curfew shall not ring tonight for you and me because of our beloved's sacrifice. Curfew shall never ring. So Paul has shown that because of what Jesus has done, no one can be against us and no one can condemn us. And finally, most gloriously of all, he shows that nothing can separate us from that love. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? One of the things that I find most remarkable is that everything Paul, well, first, everything Paul said in verses 31 to 34 shows us the love of Christ, who doesn't charge sinners with their sins, but justifies them from them, who doesn't condemn sinners for their sins, but bears their condemnation for them. Greater love has no man than that he lay down his life for his friends. So the love of Jesus, who did that, is the greatest love. But if the very power of God has made us recipients of this love, what could possibly steal it away from us? From us? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Like the other questions in this section, we can think of many things that might indicate to us that we have been separated from the love of Christ. But this time, Paul doesn't make us do the thinking or make up a list. He gives us the list himself. What about tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So as I was going to say, the fascinating thing about this list is that Paul himself experienced all these things. In 2 Corinthians 11, he says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. So Paul himself has experienced each of the seven things that he lists in verse 35, except for the last one, the sword, and he would faithfully submit to that at the ending of his life. Thus he has proven for himself that these things are quite incapable of interfering with his experience and appreciation of the ongoing presence of Christ's love. Charles Spurgeon once told a story on himself to illustrate this. He was walking in the country with a friend when he noticed a barn with a weather vane on its roof. At the top of the vane were these words, God is love. Spurgeon remarked to his companion that he thought this was a rather inappropriate place for such a message. Weather vanes are changeable, he said, but God's love is constant. I don't agree with you about those words, Charles, said his friend. You have misunderstood the meaning. That sign is indicating a truth. Regardless of which way the wind blows, God is love. Regardless of which way the wind blows, God's love is with us. In verse 36, Paul breaks his chain of thought for a moment to quote from Psalm 44. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The psalm depicts the persecution of Israel by the nations. And in this case, certainly not in every case, but in this case, they were not suffering because they had forgotten Yahweh or turned away to a foreign God or any of those things. 
Instead, they were suffering for Yahweh's sake because of their ongoing loyalty to him. And as a result of that, as his people, they faced death for their loyalty. Paul is teaching that even suffering unto death might be experienced by believers, but that not even this ultimate degree of suffering could separate them from the love of God, which had saved them. Verse 37, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not only are the things listed in verse 35 incapable of separating us from Christ's love, but we are more than conquerors with respect to these things. More than conquerors. It's, it's a wonderful translation. The translation actually goes all the way back to the Geneva Bible, one of the earliest English versions. It's a translation of an intensive verb that Paul's used, literally hyper-conquerors or super conquerors. Paul wants to emphasize that believers not only conquer such adverse, adver, excuse me, adversities, but under the providential hand of God, these things even work for our good. We actually benefit from these things. Notice that the victory is not ours, for it is only through the one who loved us that it happens. Since Christ proved his love for us by his sufferings, therefore our sufferings cannot separate us from his love. So Paul now reaches the, the crescendo of the crescendo of the crescendo, verse 38. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul said last week that we know God works for good. He ends more personally with, I am sure, I am convinced he uses the perfect tense in the Greek, meaning I have become convinced and I remain convinced. Can anything separate us from God's love? No, nothing can and nothing will. Nothing can separate you. And so Paul chooses 10 items, which some people might think are powerful enough to create a barrier between us and Christ. He mentions them in four pairs while leaving two of them on their own. So it begins with neither death nor life, which probably accru uh, alludes to the crisis of death and the groanings of life. Paul starts with death because he had just mentioned it in verse 36. For your sake, we are killed all day long. And life might be a simple contrast to this. We are held in his love, whether dead or alive. But in view of the context, I, I think it's the groanings of life that Paul has been talking about that he has in mind here. And the assurance that we need not give in to the distress or the despair of these groanings or even to our own weakness. Because through it all, through it all, Christ loves us. Next, Paul says that neither angels nor rulers can separate us from the love of Christ. This pair was probably chosen to represent the whole of the spirit world, all created spiritual beings. Demons, of course, would gleefully separate us from Christ's love if they could, but they can't. Angels can't, and of course they also won't. But Paul's point is that even the most powerful spiritual beings, angels and archangels, demons and their demonic master, all of these are powerless against the love of Christ that has drawn us and bound us to him. The next pair refers to time, things present nor things to come. The believer need have no fear that either present or future circumstances and events will call into question his relationship to God in Christ. No matter how long and evil today gets, Nothing that currently impacts us will be able to separate us from that love. And no matter what comes our way tomorrow, 
nothing to come will be able to separate us. And no matter how many tomorrows follow, a few or many or years or thousands of years, they cannot serve to erode the love that Christ has for us. The next word, powers, stands alone. Paul at times uses this Greek word to denote miracles. He may mean that nothing like that, performed even by demons, can threaten our security as believers. But Paul also often uses the word powers with that previous word we just saw, rulers, to denote spiritual beings and spiritual authorities. And he reminds us in Ephesians 6 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is, as David said at the beginning of the service, an evil array of forces aligned against us, but he who is with us is way more powerful than all of them put together. And his power is perfectly communicated to us as love. The final pair is neither height nor depth. Just as nothing in time can separate us from God's love, so nothing in space, in place, can do so. The psalmist wrote beautifully about this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the outermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Our relationship with God through the indwelling spirit is actually more intimate. We are actually more held than even the psalmist could have imagined. So at this point, as Paul's rolling along, you can think of him pausing for an instant, maybe his pen held in the air and asking himself, okay, have I forgotten anything? And he concludes, nor anything else in all creation. Nothing, nothing, and even if I haven't thought of it, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And so if there's something else not on this list that you feel is a threat the she feels like a, a crowbar that wants to lever you away from God's love, Paul says, hey, don't worry about that one either. Nothing else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love is fully, freely, and finally attested to us in the person and work of Christ Jesus. Because he died for us and rose from the dead for us and ascended to heaven where at God's right hand he intercedes for us, then nothing, nothing, nothing can undo that. Nothing, nothing, nothing can threaten us. No one who is against us can harm us. No one who wants to condemn us can find grounds to do so since our condemnation fell on Christ. And no one and no thing that wants to separate us from Christ has any hope of success because God is for us. Nothing can be against us or condemn us or separate us from his strong bonds of love.